Cam Newton last year against Atlanta took a massive, a massive uh, hit, and it really opened that conversation again, this, the, the concussion that he sustained in that loss to the Falcons back in October of last year. It really opened up that conversation about concussions again. I think we have Cam Newton and how he, he talked about the concussion afterwards. The thing that was extremely frustrating with me, and, and um, it's not like it's curable. You know, it's not like it's a sprained ankle. It's not like it's a, you know, a torn ACL or, you know, you know, just certain things that you can just say, oh, it's four to six weeks and then you'll be back out there. Or, you know, it's just a week out. No, the side effects looms for so long. And just when you think you're, you're OK, it's like, oh, whoa, what's this? Yeah. Oh, whoa. What's this? Somebody who can certainly address that issue. We've been talking about him. Dr. Phil Stig joins us now. You catch him on the NFL sidelines. He's a neuro consultant uh, for the for the Giants, and we're hoping to get him back on. I guess he was sitting in our virtual re- green room. We're trying to get him back. But uh, he certainly knows what that's like to go up and down the sidelines. Like I mentioned, when you think about when you think about uh, NF- NFLers and the hits that they take. Hey, Dr. Steeg, thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you? Good. So, you know, we just heard Cam Newton talk about his concussion. He said he it was like nothing else. And I, I think that some people don't really understand concussions. We talk about it. But in a nutshell, how do you describe even concussions? Well, it's a poorly dis- defined clinical problem. I mean, it, it, it sounds a little bit scientific, but it's, you know, it's a complex pathophysiologic process that affects the brain. But when we do an MRI and a CT scan, there isn't anything that we see immediately. Uh, in a delayed fashion, we might see some minor findings. But essentially what happens is that there is some traumatic event, either a bad shake or a bad blow to the head, and it disrupts the normal function of your brain cells so that your brain just stops functioning for a brief period of time. Yeah. And, and and I mentioned this before you came on, that you're one of the few neurosurgeons who actually you work on the sidelines at the Giants' home games. So for you as a neurosurgeon, what does that entail, what you have to do? We work closely with the team doctors and also the trainers, <clears throat> as well as the camera in the sky. And when either any of us or the camera in the sky sees something or a player, a player complains about a blow to the head, we have them on the sideline and we do a quick sideline assessment. And if there's a concern that something is going on beyond that, we would take them into the locker room for privacy reasons and take them through a formal concussion evaluation. And if we feel that they've had a concussion, they're withdrawn from the game. Yeah. Um, great description of that. So when we look at concussions and we think of football, but there are certainly other sports. I've, I've talked about this on my show before kids, adults, and, and uh, that, uh, are weekend warriors or just having fun playing sports. Are there other sports we're just, I mean, we're at risk, right? Period. Oh, it's for anything really. I mean, it's not even, I don't know if you consider skateboarding a sport. But skateboarding, rollerblading, obviously soccer, hockey, um, uh, uh, baseball, if you get hit in the head with a blow, basketball for girls, uh, all of these sports, bicycle riding is um, a, a big issue, as well as skiing during the winter. And one of the problems also is that now that children are wearing helmets with their bikes or they're wearing uh, helmets with skiing, or with rollerblading for that matter, it seems to increase their risk-taking, and it may actually lead to more concussions. Wow. So so as we talk about like even skateboarding, like you said, what's the biggest difference between brain injury in adults versus kids and then even uh, females versus males? It seems that children under 18 and females uh, have a higher incidence of concussion. In females, it may be that they're more likely to report a concussion than a male for for multiple reasons. Uh, Some of the physiologic reasons why a woman might have a greater risk for a concussion is that their head-to-neck mass is is greater. They just don't have the, the neck musculature that a male has, and they can actually have more of the translational, rotational, whipping kind of motion that can give you a concussion. 
Wow. Uh, here's a really important question. Anyone listening to us, if a person has had a concussion, the symptoms don't get better, what would you say they should do? What would you recommend? What's the options? What I would do is I would contact my family physician probably first since you have a relationship with them. Uh, but there certainly are concussion centers like ours, the Wild Cornell Brain and Spine Center. You can contact our concussion center and we'll hook you up with the appropriate doctor. Many times we'll have you see a neurologist. Uh, if it's somebody that has a post-concussive syndrome, we may get you hooked up with our neuropsychologist to do some formal testing uh, and then hopefully get you plugged into a therapeutic regimen. All right. I love it. Wild Cornell Prestigious Institute, definitely. Dr. Stieg, thanks so much for joining us here on NBC Sports Radio. Thanks so much for having me.